Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. I know you, we have different colleagues from different parts of the world, so thank you for being here. And the talk today will be a webinar CBD talk on the journey to fellowship status and the principle of effective mentoring. Uh, I think that's a great photo as well, which I think Jason was happy with, where, you know, we're looking to assist colleagues in, you know, better self and also improve yourself in your career, in your personal life, uh, and especially really in our profession in the construction industry. So we've got Jason here. Uh, I will introduce Jason formally as well. But as you can see, there's a guest below called Lyra Lewis. Uh, she got chartered a fellowship status in 2020. She's based in Chicago, in uh, USA, in Chicago, in USA. She'll be joining us, fingers crossed, with the technology being okay. She'll be joining us on, uh, at 6 p.m. today. So fingers crossed for that. And Lyra will really, I mean, you know, Lyra was obviously, Jason mentored Lyra and on to become a fellow of our IP as well. So very important uh, to have Lyra's views of, you know, mentors and, and her work she's doing in the USA right now. So she'll be joining us from Chicago. We've got Jason from the UK and I'm the host for Mauritius as well as Davison. So um, moving on swiftly, uh, the agenda today will have a quick housekeeping uh, introduction presentation from Jason. There'll be lots of questions in between, lots of surveys to make sure like it's really uh, interactive with yourself. Uh, there'll be uh, Lyra, you know, technically joining us at 6 p.m. today from USA. Um, and uh, she will be touching on a small presentation as well as answering your question and answers. Uh, there'll be Q&A, 6.15 to 6.45, and hopefully we conclude by 6.45. So again, quick answer for, for many of you who are here our first time. Uh, you will see if you're on your PC, if you're on your iPad, you will see all the options right on top. But if you're on your laptop, you will see a view option on your PC, which is top of screen. Uh, there'll be audio screen on PC, which is left-hand side of your bottom screen. Um, there'll be the raise icon, if you need to raise your hand, if we're asking you, um, to confirm something, please do raise your hand. Uh, there'll be the question and answers. And then if you want to leave the webinar, not because you're bored, but if you just want to leave it because of, you know, personal reason, that's on your right hand side. So there'll be a quick poll, which will again make sure that we get, you know, full engagement and we really get to know what you're thinking about in terms of, you know, future mentoring and having a mentor in your life or a mentee looking for mentor. So uh, thank you for very much. I'd like to thank Jason for his time back in the UK, giving back to all of us here in Mauritius, as well as some part of the world um, uh, as, you're, as you're here. So there'll be a certificate attendance uh, as well. So please, please, please email me, plus your name as well, full name, so that at least I know who you are. Uh, so hopefully this will be an hour plus CPD. A uh, copy of slide, again, Jason will uh, let us know whether he'll, because there's lots of confidentiality in Jason's slide, so he can give you one or two slides, but depending on what Jason says, because he's working on nuclear project where there's lots of confidential stuff as well. So who I am then, I think mo most of you know now, I love construction, I love learning, I love sharing, and I love people. Uh, I wanna share something quickly uh, before I start. I wrote a blog on mentoring um, early part of this year. And um, it was really, uh, you know, well received from colleagues in the industry, lots of comment regarding mentoring. And I want to share a few things of you, uh, which I write, uh, and I want to obviously um, share that with you now. Mentoring is one of the key enablers to an enhance skill in the construction industry and serve as a power, powerful tool that the future is in safe hand. Very important. Giving back to the profession is an absolute paramount to maintain standards, and professionalism in the industry. The secret to living is giving, as stated by Tony Robbins, life and business strategist. We all have something to share and give to others. And this is what we're doing today. We all here, you, the mentor, myself, and everybody else to give back. Uh, as Barack Obama said, do we settle for the world as it is or do we work for the world as it should be? So for me, from a mentor standpoint, it has always been about you know, continuously improving standard in the profession, maintain quality and bringing new talents for an inclusive, diverse and forward thinking institution. Absolutely paramount for our profession. Uh, again, I just wanted to touch on that. So there was a question which I answered myself on the blog. 
uh, which was also published by the Royal Institute of, uh, Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. What is the most important aspect of a mentor? And that was it. So undoubtedly time. We got to find time to mentor people. If you're busy, you'll be struggling and you will disappoint a lot of your mentee or vice versa. So finding time is absolutely paramount in order to encourage, guide, and motivate our ICS APC candidate on the journey to become a chartered surveyor. Uh, I was reading a book as well from Michelle uh, Obama memoirs. Michelle Obama, in her captivating best-selling memoir, um, which was Becoming, stated that time, as far as my father was concerned, was a gift you give to, or you gave to other people. Absolutely a powerful statement indeed. So finding the time to give back, and please, 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 um, if you haven't read this memoir, definitely you know, look into it. You get so much wisdom, and it's already have 25 southern reviews on Amazon, and lots of 15 southern you know, comments. So I, I know definitely get this book and take a screenshot if you want uh, for this particular slide. So Obama, as well, Michelle Obama goes on to say, success is about how much money you make, it's about the difference you make in people's life. And hence today we've got a great mentor in, in the like of Jason and many of you watching as well to give back. So I wanna do a quick survey uh, before we really kick start. So I'm gonna share with you my poll. Um, the first question is, and I'm gonna allow the panelists to vote as well is, do you have a mentor? I've got 30 seconds. And if you can let us know if you have a mentor, please be, be honest because this is something we will be developing as we go through the presentation today. So do you have a mentor? Um, yes or no? Already 62% um, of you have voted. Please keep your voted in. Very, very important to find out if do you have a mentor. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Uh, if you have a mentor, please. So I'm just going to end polling now. 70% so of you have voted and I'm going to share the result. So uh, do you have a mentor? And we've got the answer here. Um, a whopping 45% is saying yes, and 55% is saying no. So something again, I will touch on that uh, as we go along later on. And I'm gonna share another one with you before we really kick started. And I'm gonna launch polling, Jason and Davison can vote as well. And uh, it's about mentoring. Do you think having a mentor by your side will help you achieve greater heights. So do you think having a mentor by your side will help achieve greater height, get you to where you should be or where you didn't expect to be? So 70, 65% of you have voted. Do you think having a mentor by your side will help you achieve new height? Again, 73%, um, please, please, please. Can you put your vote in as we get through to this? Um, and again, something Jason will have to pick up on that. Uh, for his wisdom. So I'm just going to end polling. 80% of you have voted and I'm going to share the result now. So a whopping 98% is saying yes, having a mentor will be hugely beneficial. So something again we will be discussing with um, Jason and Lyra uh, uh, afterwards. So I'm just going to stop result and we will be moving on to obviously there'll be lots of question and answers coming through as well. So I want to share a video with you. I want to share a video with you. Just make sure that uh, my screen and my share and sound are good. And uh, Davison, please do um, send me a message if the video is okay as well. All right, so thank you. And I'm just going to play the video now. <laughs> The one thing we all do is we solve problems. It's different every day. One day the focus is on schedule, the next day it's cost, the third day it's a technical issue that something doesn't fit. My goal as a mentor is to make sure that the engineers receive all the training and skills that they need to be successful. My goal as a mentor is to help our engineers and to provide them with all the tools that they need and the support that they need to develop into the future of Great Core. They present a family atmosphere by just taking you in as, as one of their own. And they make sure that, that you are gonna be the best person that you can be, not just professionally, but also personally. We know that the type of people that we hire are ambitious and motivated and wanna learn and perform as much as they can for future project management roles. I know the value of the program. I was part of it and, and
can you hear me okay? I can hear you now. I yes, think that's yes. yeah, yeah, right. Okay, just bear with me. Uh, I think there was a small uh, hiccup. I just, uh, we lost it. Can you increase the sound, Daniel? Graycore continually reinvests in the company. Process for yourself. The growth within the company is very organic. Uh, a lot of promotion from within. I mean, I started as an engineer with the company 15 years ago. Graycore started in 1921 and started with doing demolition work and has constantly improved its capabilities and services throughout its entire history. You get a brilliant opportunity to learn and grow. And essentially, that's an environment where you don't have a lot of office support or backup, you know, in that local jurisdiction. So you're trying to gain more experience. You're trying to take on more responsibilities. Craycor continually reinvests in the company by continuing education and giving additional training to its employees. Raycor really helps out the travelers. They know that it can be stressful, you know, moving away from your friends and family. They do a good job of, of making sure that, that you're taken care of out on, on the job. I think the biggest value, the way I see it, is that our decisions with the amount of time and investment in employee training, a lot of it is focused on safety. They do a good job of just making sure everyone's on the same page. Working at Graycor, you really get to pick your own career path what you as the employee want to do for yourself going forward. We encourage the youth to be proactive in their own development. So if you have a desire to advance in your career, and if you're proactive in seeking opportunity and development opportunities, then you know really the sky is the limit. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, everybody can see my screen still. If you can put your hands up, please. That'd be hugely appreciated. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, there was a small glitch up with the Wi-Fi, so thank you, everybody. Uh, so I'm just going to formally now produce the uh, presenter, uh, Jason Boyle, a friend. Um, uh, Jason also was here in Mauritius uh, via Skype uh, in 2018 as part of Industry 4.0, uh, where he showcased his um, work that he was doing for the nuclear industry as being an architect. I'm sure uh, Jason will uh, definitely uh, touch on that as well. So in 2017, Jason Boyle became the youngest fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architect, uh, which is the RIBA, and with the abbreviation of FRIBA. And in 2018, he was awarded fellowship of the Royal Society of Art, which is FRSA. He's currently the RIB ambassador for civil infrastructure in the UK. In 2018, Jason set up a mentoring company, which has successfully mentored many architects and also one recent fellow of RIBA. Um, Jason has lectured in Rome, Italy, lectured at Manchester School of Architecture, and was the past member of the RIBA Northwest Regional Council. He's currently working on one of the three UK nuclear mega project for the UK. So please join me in welcoming uh, Jason, everybody, and if you can put your hands up. I'm just going to stop sharing, and if you can, Jason, if you can join us there as we go through. So let's get Jason um, on, the, on the screen and Jason to share um, his slides. Okay, is that, is that okay, Anil? Yes, we can see all your screen okay. And uh, can everybody again put your hands up, please, for uh, if you see Jason's uh, screen okay. Yes, all good to go. I'm ready because we, we will be also doing uh, question and answers. I haven't seen yes. the slide myself, so I'll be looking forward to listen to you as well, Jason. Great, okay. Thank you, Anil. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to uh, talk to you all. Um, I'm going to go through this presentation fairly fast, so you just bear with me because there's a lot of ground to cover. I'm just going to turn my timer on as well, just so I can keep uh, abreast of the time. Okay, so um, this is the subject of the journey to fellowship and the principles of effective mentoring. So as you can see, um, um, that you can contact me on, on these various uh, social media platforms. So the agenda is a bit about my background, um, my journey to fellowship and tips on how you could be a fellow. 
the history of mentoring, uh, what it is. Um, and we're going to do an, an exercise which um, it's, it went down really well in Rome. Um, it's going to be difficult, but I think we've got a way around it to try and do this without seeing my audience. And we're going to look at the pillars to achieve success. And if we have time, we're going to come on to the, highly, uh, the habits of highly effective people. So that's what we're going to cover. So this is the last years of my life. Eight years in the making, at a cost of a quarter of a billion pounds, the Silos Maintenance Facility is our newest recruit. It's essentially a radioactive workshop where the equipment used to empty our most hazardous legacy silo is maintained. Well, the SMF, the Silos Maintenance Facility, is a fundamentally important plant for the, for the Magnox Wolf Storage Silo program. Um, we empty the waste from the silo, about 11,000 cubic metres of it, and we have to transfer it to a downstream facility. And we have to use a shielded flask uh, to make that move. We've got a fleet of about 25 flasks in total. They're referred to as a package. Um, and each of those packages is quite sophisticated in its design. It has instrumentation, it has sealing arrangements, and it, has, it each has an individual hoist arrangement within it. Those uh, elements of the, of the package have to be maintained over the 25 to 30 year life of the retrievals program. And that's precisely what this facility is capable of doing. If you, if you look at a Formula One racing team, um, it requires the pits team to keep it out on the circuit. The SMF is the pits team for retrievals from MSSS. So without the SMF, MSSS will start, but it won't finish. The building is massive, with its freshly clad outer, cavernous interior and sparkling floor grid. This giant stands in shiny contrast next to its much older neighbour, Calder Hall. The success of the project safety record speaks volumes. We have received over 23 safety awards. Our, we've been recognised by our peers with Sellafield uh, Contractors Annual Safety Award. We've taken the project through from initial design, through detailed design, right through construction, and we've hurt nobody. And you'll hear the term used, zero harm. Well, we've achieved that on this project. I think the most important thing for the success of this project has been a level of collaboration between the two, the, between Cavendish Nuclear and Balcabiti and, and the client. We, you know, we, we, we've worked together as one sort of fully integrated team. As with all of our new plants, the day comes when it stops being a building project and starts being an operational facility. With waste retrievals due to start in 2019, that day is now. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to working with this new team and working up and, uh, and like basically learning everything all together. I've always worked in plants where it's been old pieces of equipment, where this is a brand new experience to me and I'm looking forward to it. We've built a nice new uh, team uh, who haven't worked together before. It's a big opportunity for all the team. Uh, it's a big opportunity for myself to set new, new characteristics of a team. Uh, we are really looking forward to, to working the facility and getting the maximum out of this facility. You create a family atmosphere uh, and everybody's pulling in the same direction. So although it's good to get it across the line, there's also that little bit of, little bit of a tinge of a sadness. Um, but I think everybody has been involved in SMF has been really proud of what they've achieved. Okay, thank you. Um, I just thought a video is probably the best way of explaining in a, in a few minutes. Just, Jason, um, Jason, just a quick one. Yeah. Uh, Sure. This, this video really look amazing. You spent eight years on it. I mean, how did you feel by looking at this video now with, with the emotion going up and down? Oh, and yeah, it, it's, it, it's, um, it, it was a fantastic thing to actually see the video and you can actually find it on YouTube. Um, yeah, I think one of the things I'm really proud of is we delivered that building. We cut two years off the program. You know, we delivered um, um, it very safe no accidents um it was using bim for the did first you, time did, on a did you, did you say did you say no accident at all no 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 reportable accidents no for, for, um, eight, for eight years yeah 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 wow. two 2.5 million man hours and it was um a big team effort and a lot of collaboration um and you know again I'm re i think i'm really proud of the 
which is why I got the fellowship, which is why I'm kind of talking about this is introducing uh, building information technology for this plant, a brand new building, uh, complex. It's, it doesn't look much from the outside um, on purpose and it's so complex inside, you know. Uh, it I, really is. I, I have to say it requires a lot of energy to work on one single project for eight years. I've never heard of this and I'm sure the <laughs> audience. Um, so, yeah, no, I think uh, amazing. So just to finish off, um, yeah. how was the team bonding in terms of, I'm sure there was lots of mentors for eight years. How was, what's your, what's your views on that? Yeah, I think um, the, the, the mentoring side of things was, I think, through the, the sort of project managers and the people who in, integrated the team, we all worked in one office, so in one space. So you had the contractor working with this, the consultants, working with the clients, all in one space using um, a digital model. And that's what I think helps us all being in the same location. Wow, yeah. awesome. Thank you very much indeed for that. And I think Probably. the audience will make note. Uh, please proceed, Jason. Sorry. Yeah, okay. So this is just, these are just my personal views of how um, I believe um, you could become a fellow. Um, it may not work for everyone. Okay, so I think people who become, become a fellow is um, you've led or have led a proactive life on a project that's had a positive social or environmental impact at local, regional, national or international level. This is from the Arabia website. So these are statements of what you need to prove if you want to become a fellow. So if you, you've contributed to the advancement of thought leader, leadership in architecture, so that could apply to kind of any um, profession that you're in, through education, research, development, or use of technology. You've served at local, regional, national, or international working groups that's affected change, influenced or supported architecture, or the built environment. And you've received an honor or an award for a significant contribution to architecture. Um, and you've made a significant contribution to architecture through local, regional, national, international initiatives. So, so what I think the Arabia is saying there is you've got to prove three out of them five. So, you, you, so on the application form, you choose three and you focus on three. And that's how um, you, um, you, know, you apply for fellowship. It's just worth pointing out only eight people a year pretty much are awarded fellowship. So it's, 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 quite a, it's quite a high bar. Um, so what did I do? Um, so I, so I, part of the, my application and I put forward evidence that I, I brought and used BIM in nuclear. So first, first person to really do that back in 2011. So I lectured on the proven benefits of BIM. So I didn't just work my day-to-day -day job using the technology I kind of, uh, lectured and spoke about it. I went to London and, and lots of other regional events. I wrote about the subject in professional journals and then I joined um, steering committees, uh, BIM for Nuclear and BIM for Clients that were set up by the government. So tips, tips for self, uh, to fellowship status is you need to do more than you do in your job. So if you're an employed person, that is not going to be enough to gain in fellowship. It just isn't. Um, teaching or lecturing on subjects that interest you, writing articles for journals is another way. Um, and you could join your regional, um, national and international groups. And you, can, you should be leading change within your profession and be focused on that advancement of your profession. So these are things that um, the, the criteria that they're looking for for fellows. You're, you're, you, you're becoming an ambassador for um, the profession. So where do I start and where do you start? So why not get a mentor? Is everything okay there, Neil? Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 cool. It's just you, your camera went off, yeah, okay. Yes, yes. So, so why, why get a mentor, really? Um, you could have this guy, award-winning award -winning mentor. He doesn't, say, he doesn't say this is very modest, but yeah, um, you could have no better mentor than this guy. So a short history of mentoring and who was the first mentor. So I don't need to read all this out, but um, it's, it's based in Greek mythology, essentially. And strong relationships build the foundation of guidance and support. 
And the word mentor has become synonymous with teacher, counselor, coach, facilitator, motivator, and above all, friend. So, um, however, Athena, goddess of war and patrons of the arts and industry, assumes the form of mentor and accompanies Telemachus on his quest for a search for his father. And history and legends record the deeds of princes and kings, but each of us has the birthright to actualize our potential through their deeds and work. And mentors move towards that actualization. And this is from Shia Gordon, 1997 mentoring. So benefits of having a mentor. Um, well, it's a kind of journey and a kind of steps, you know, steps to, to doing a mentor. You, you take one step at a time and it really is, um, I believe, that, that simple. And every great achiever, I, in the words of Leala Atika, is, is, that's, um, is inspired by a great mentor. I'll give you some examples of this. And my belief is holistic mentoring. So um, it offers a supported guiding process that helps individuals understand life from a different perspective. Um, and it's all about this, this um, whole life holistic way. So, so Freddie Laker, who um, worked in airlines, had his own airline company. He mentored who? Well, Richard Branson wow. used Freddie Laker as his mentor. Wow. An author, Mary Ann Glue, who mentored, well, she oh. was a mentor to Oprah. Oprah, yeah. Yeah, Oprah. So, and what I just say is, um, happiness is a choice. So, if you're successful in your life outside of your work, you've got more chance and uh, being successful in your work. So you can't have the two divorced from each other. If you're unhappy in your work, generally it's gonna affect your personal life. I think that's, um, that's, that's kind of key. And then there's the question, have you ever wondered why some people are more successful than others? You see people, don't you? They have this aura about them. They, they you say, how can he be so successful? How can she be so successful? And, and why am I not successful? Well, you can learn to become more successful by becoming more effective. This is my belief. So how good are you at listening? I think this is maybe where, well, we'll come on to it in a second, but I just wanna give you some facts about listening. So listening is learned first, it's used the most, and it's taught the least. So we don't teach people to actually listen. So speaking is learnt the second, used the most, and taught the least at 30%. And then reading, learnt the third, used next least, taught next most. And writing is learnt fourth, used the least, and taught the most. So we're gonna do a listening exercise now, but I thought you could put that first poll up, um, Emil, uh, yeah. about, about listening. Yes, um, just bear with us. Uh, we also have uh, Lara who's joined in. Lara, I've just uh, switched off your video, but can you hear us okay? Okay, uh, yes. Lara, can you hear us okay? Yes, I could hear you. Okay, I'm just gonna put you on mute for now. Uh, you can mute yourself if you want. Thank you, Lara, for being here from the USA. So the first question from uh, Jason is, uh, Jason, before start, uh, Jason, I'm just launching it now. And can you see Jason? Do yeah, you think see. you are a good listener? So that's the start of the um, Jason uh, poll. Do you think you're a good listener? And uh, already 35% of you have voted. Do you think you're a good listener? Very important for all of us here. Um, and 67% uh, of you have voted so far. And please, 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 70%. Um, do you think you're a good listener? Yes or no? Uh, it seems a, a quite interesting figure. 74% of you have voted. So I'm just going to end polling now, Jason, and I'm going to share the result with you. So share result. And... Um, oh, okay. 
70% is saying yes, and 30% is saying no. What's your views on that, Jason? Yeah, my, my, my thoughts on that are, um, let's, let's see how you believe you are after this exercise. <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Okay. So, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, basically now I'm gonna read you something. I want you to try and focus on what I'm, what I'm saying, and um, so I'm, that's a tip there. And then we'll ask you some questions about uh, what I've just read. So it's just being honest. Just um, listen, and then we'll ask uh, questions. Okay, it's a fairy tale. So the story is, once upon a time, there was a great city called Glum that stood beside a lake in the kingdom of Bong. In the center of the city was a castle where the king lived with his only daughter, Christine. The king could no longer walk, but he was often seen being pushed around the city in a white wheelchair by his servants. Christina was a popular princess, happy and always willing to help others. The people of Bong, often commented that she would make a good queen. Now it so happened that as well as the king, his daughter, his subjects, there lived in the kingdom of Bum, two witches. Groga, an ugly disfigured witch, lived on the other side of the lake in a dark, damp cave. Gwendolyn, a beautiful witch, who wore a gown that sparkled with the light of a thousand crystals, lived in a house to the west. On the 10th anniversary of Groga's arrival, the king was wheeled onto his balcony where he addressed those gathered below. Who will rid the kingdom of my arch enemy Groga? He asked. Many brave men have ventured forth on this mission before, but none of those sent have returned. Do any of you have the courage to complete this deed? So the crowd included knights from all the surrounding lands. Their grand, their grand horses neighed at the ruler's words, but only one of the crowd spoke out, a stranger who had arrived the day before. I will kill her, said the stranger, in return for your crown. The king replied, that is too much to ask, but I will give you half of all the gold in the city treasury if you get rid of the kingdom of her, if you rid the kingdom of her. So the stranger accepted the offer and went to see the beautiful Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn was impressed by the stranger's boldness as she agreed to help in return for a share of the king's gold. She went into another room where she mixed a strange potion. This she poured into a small green bottle. This will give you the strength of 10 men, she said, handing the potion to the stranger. The stranger traveled from Gwendolyn's house to the dark caverns on the opposite side of the lake where Groga, who had seen her fate in a crystal ball, was waiting. So you have come, as many men before you have, she said, seeking the king's favour. They fought for many hours, but this witch was no match for her adversary. And eventually, tired and exhausted, she agreed to leave the kingdom forever. The stranger returned to the city to claim the promised reward. The end. So if you could just put up the first question. Yeah. So the first question, I just want, he, yeah. go on, Jason. Yeah the, first, yeah, the first question, if you just answer these true or false, and we'll do these fairly fast. So, so, so the, keep the first question was, the city was called Bang, true or false? I'll give you 10 seconds, five seconds, actually. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and polling. Uh, and I'm going to share the result with you, uh, Jason. And it's 68% is saying true. And 33% is saying false. What's your views on that? Right. Right. Well, I'll tell you the answer. The answer is actually false. The city wow. was called the city was called Glum. The kingdom was called Bung. Wow. So the fact that both words sounded similar may have made this difficult. Okay, okay. all right, next. thank you. Next one. Uh, the next question is um, the king, and I'm just gonna launch polling now. And it goes on to, I'll give you 10 seconds. So the city was ruled by an old king who could no longer walk. Seven seconds, eight seconds, nine, 10. I'll give you five more seconds, 11, 12, 13, 
14 stop polling. And I'm going to share the result with you now. And 85% is saying true, and 15% is saying no. So the answer is false. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so we are not we are not told the king's age. So he, he may or may have not been old. These the people who said that he was old or thought that he was old probably are making an assumption based on the fact that he could no longer walk. Wow. So, okay. So, so how, yeah. Uh, moving on to my fifth question, which is the castle, and I'm just going to launch falling now. Again, the, to the, all the participants, the castle was in the same center of the city. The castle was in the same center of the city. True or false? Again, please put your vote. 25 percent have voted. I'll give you five more seconds. 14, 15, 16, four more seconds, 17, 18, 19, and I'm just going to stop result now. So share the result. And 49 percent is saying true, and 51 percent is saying false. Wow. And well, I won't say any more than that. So that's, um, so again, most people got it wrong slightly. Yeah. Wow. Again. Okay. So again, uh, we all wrong on that one. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm just going to uh, issue you with the next one. The other question is Groga. So I know you mentioned about Groga earlier. And the question is Groga yeah. was a wicked witch who lived in a cave on the other side of the lake. Grogan was a wicked witch who lived in a cave on the other side of the lake. 33% of you have voted, five more seconds left. True or false? And you've got three seconds left. Please, please, please put your vote in, true or false, and polling. And I'm gonna share the result with you, Jason. And the poll is 50%, 57% is saying true, and 43% is saying false. Well, you're all bad listeners, aren't you? So it's actually false. So at no point are we told that Groga is wicked. Participants probably, which is what you are, assume that she was wicked because she's ugly and disfigured. We know too that the king doesn't like her. But again, nowhere in that story um, that the king... king is good. Uh, it's again it's um the majority are wrong okay so i'm going to move on to the next question and we're going to go to the princess uh on that one and i'm going to launch polling now uh can you see it uh so please 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 princess christina was very beautiful true or false princess christina was very beautiful uh you've got seven seconds left Princess Christina was very beautiful. Please, please, please put your vote in. Hopefully we get that right here. Princess Christina, so I'm gonna stop polling now and share the result with Jason. Uh, a whopping 61% uh, say false and 39% say true. Jason. Uh, much better this time, so yeah, false. So Christine, Princess Christina was popular. She was also happy and always telling uh, always willing to help others, but no way in the story at all she is beautiful. So majority okay. are correct. Thank you very much indeed. We'll move on to poll number eight. Um, the stranger. So I'm just going to allow you to vote as well. Um, the stranger was a knight from far away. The stranger was a knight from far away. True or false? You've got 10 seconds left. The stranger was a knight from far away. True or false? Five seconds left. Three, two, one, zero. And polling now. And I'm just going to share the result. And 35% is saying true, and 65% is saying false. Jason? Yeah, well, the majority have got it again, so false it is. So the crowd included knights. We don't know that the stranger was one. So yes, it's uh, okay. false. So, okay, thank you. It's getting better as we get along. Next one is on yeah. killing. And uh, I'm just going to launch polling now. And the question on that one is, the stranger wanted to be made a king in return for killing Groga. The stranger wanted to be a king in return to be made king in return for killing Groga. True or false? You've got seven seconds left. 14, 15 seconds, four more to go. Three, two, one. Please keep your vote in. 
and I'm just going to share a result with you now. So a whopping 69% is saying false and 31% true. So yeah, so okay, so it is false. So, and I'll just tell you why. So we don't know if the stranger is even a man. So we don't know if he or she would be king or queen. Anyway, the stranger only asks for the crown and doesn't specifically state he or she wants a title or, e or even power. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a few more left, guys. So um, we'll move on to the 10-1 on Fortune. So again, please, 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 please be careful on that one. The king offered the stranger a great fortune instead. The king offered the stranger a great fortune instead. True or false, you've got 10 seconds left. The king offered the stranger a great fortune instead. True or false, three, two, one. I'm gonna step polling now and then share the result with you. So, a, well, true 41% and 59% says false, Jason. Yeah, so false. So it's false. So the king offers the stranger half of the gold, all the gold in the treasury. But we aren't told how much gold is in the treasury. Maybe none. Wow. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and we move on to the witch. This is a very good question as well. Thank you for that, Jason. Um, a good witch lived to the west of the city. A good witch lived to the west of the city. True or false? You've got nine seconds left. A good witch leave to the west of the city. Hopefully we get that one right as well. We've been doing really well since. A good witch leave to the west of the city. True or false and polling now. And I'm gonna share the result. So really interactive on that one. 71% saying false and 29% is saying true. Jason. Yeah, so this one is false. So you, again, I think you've perked up towards the middle of the questions. So we're, we're not told Gwendolyn is good, only that she's beautiful and wears a sparkly gown. Wow, okay. Uh, thank you very much. We've got uh, three more to go. Uh, in fact, five more to go. So we're gonna sh uh, launch polling now. Again, be attentive everybody. The stranger agreed to give Gwendolyn half of his goal if she helped him. The stranger agreed to give Gwendolyn half of his goal if she helped him. True or false, and five more seconds. The stranger agreed to give Gwendolyn half of his gold if she helped him, and polling now. So on this one again, I'm just gonna share the result. Jason, all yours. 46% is saying true, and 54% saying false. Yeah, it's pretty even, isn't it? So it is actually false. So wow. he, she, he or she agreed to give her a share. We're not told what the share is, and of course we don't know who the stranger is yeah awesome jason i think it's get better as we, i think you've been uh, talking on that one next one is yeah. mixed portion and again please be attentive on this wing gwendolyn mix a portion when she pour into a green bottle gwendolyn mixed a portion when she poured into a green bottle true or false please cause your vote uh five more seconds left three two Please, please, please vote and polling now. And I'm just gonna share a result. And it's a whopping 41% saying true and 59% saying false. Yes, yeah, so it Jason. is, it, uh, yeah, it is um, true. Wow. And I won't say any more than that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we've got four more to go. Yes, four more to go indeed. And the next one is, I'm gonna share polling again. And the stranger drove from Gwendolyn to Groga Gave. The stranger drove from Gwendolyn to Groga's Gave. So again, true or false? Uh, five more seconds. The stranger drove from Gwendolyn to Groga's Cave. 34. Uh, stop polling now. And I'm just going to share the result. And we have a 33% true and a whopping 67% false jason well this one is actually false so we don't know wow. the stranger wrote the story says the stranger traveled wow okay so uh thank you very much indeed uh again this is really testing our listener skill we've got three more questions to go 
I'm just going to learn Pauling now. And this one goes on to Groga had killed many men before. Groga had killed many men before. And um, true or false, 35% of you have voted. You've got seven more seconds to go. Groga had killed many men previously. Uh, true or false, finally, we stopped the poll. And I'm just going to share the result now. And 17% uh, 17, 17 say true. And 83% say false. What's your view on that one? So it is false. So we don't know whether Groga had killed anyone before. All we know is that those sent to kill her had not returned. Perhaps they had had a change of heart and left the kingdom. Okay, uh, we take very the penalty. Thank you very much indeed, Jason. We take the two penultimate question. Um, next one is on magic. So Groga's magic was no match for the stranger. Groga's mag magic was no match for the stranger. True or false? Please, please, please put your true or false and honest answer when you've been listening to Jason previously. Five more seconds left. Groga's magic was not a match for the stranger. And I'm just going to stop polling now and share the result with you right away. So 39% says true and 61% say false. What's your views on that, Jason? Yeah, well, it's actually false. So we're not told that Groga used magic. Um, yeah, so there you go. Fantastic. The last question is um, on mentoring. So, sorry, defeat. Uh, I've got one more, sorry. And I'm just going to yes. launch that. The stranger used a magic potion to defeat Groga. The stranger used a magic potion to defeat Groga's uh, spelling mistake there, apologies. But the stranger used a magic potion to defeat Groga. Five more seconds left. True or false, did the stranger use a magic potion to defeat the ultimate Groga? Here we go. And I'm going to share the result with you. 42% says true and 58% say false. Jason. Yeah. Okay. So it is false. I think with a lot of these questions, people are, are thinking now, oh, right. Every time he asks me a question, it's, uh, it's not going to be what I think it is. So it was false. Yeah. We don't know if the stranger used the potion given to him or her um, by Gwendolyn. You don't that's know. it. That, that's the, we, that's we, we've at the end of that one. Uh, thank you, Jason. And then you may continue your presentation. So I'm just going to stop that. Great. Okay. Okay, so, so I think the, the interesting, oh, okay. So the assumptions, so I think we were, we, were, we were making assumptions, especially early on with them questions, but still quite a large proportion of people weren't, uh, you weren't all getting these questions right. Um, but listening is one of the most important skills you actually have. And how well you listen has a major impact on your job effectiveness and on the quality of your relationships with others. For instance, we listen to obtain information, we listen to understand, we listen for enjoyment, and we listen to learn. Fact, 20 to 50%. So given all the listening that we do, you would think that we'd be good at it. In fact, not all of us um, are, are good at listening. Um, a researcher said, research suggests that we only remember between 25 and 50% of what we hear. That means that when you talk to your boss, colleagues, customers, or spouse for 10 minutes, so they're paying attention less than half of the conversation. So turn it around and it reveals that when you are receiving directions or being presented with information, like probably I am to you, you aren't hearing the whole message either. You hope that the important parts of, are captured in your 25 to 50%, but what if they're not? So clearly listening is a skill that we can all benefit from improving. By becoming a better listener, you can improve your productivity as well as your ability to influence, persuade, negotiate. What's more, you'll also avoid conflict and misunderstandings. All of these are necessary for workplace success. And how can you improve your listening skills? So you can take notes. You can repeat what you heard back to that person. You can be present. And what I mean by that is, you know, when someone is talking to you, 
don't be distracted, don't look at your phone, just be present in that conversation. And don't make assumptions. If you don't understand something, seek that clarification. So we're gonna come on to the, to the pillars of success, which will help um, and give you thought, I think, to um, being effective and being a productive. And these 12 pillars are based on a book by Jim Rohn and Chris Widener. And you can, it's, it's a very good book um, if, you, if you really want to buy this book. So personal success, pillar one. So success comes when you develop yourself beyond where you currently are. So you read books, you attend seminars like the one that we're doing now. You speak, you have speaking engagements, you study the best people and implement and integrate what you've learned. And these points remind me of the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. To get different results, you've got to change what you're doing. The only way things are going to change for you is when you change, and that's called personal development. So total well-being, what, this is what I mean by that, is pillar two. So this pillar is three-dimensional health. The three dimensions of the body, the physical, the soul, our intellect, emotions, and will, and the spirit is part of us that transcends this world. So the spirit is your core, the soul is your next layer, and the body is the outside. And you need to work on all three. Don't just work on one to the detriment of the other. The relationships between the three dimensions highlights the need to be transparent, to be sincere, and to be genuine. So let people see you as you really are. You should make sure the outside of you is a good reflection of the inside of you. That's total well-being, which is pillar two. And the gift of relationships is pillar three. So relationships represent the most beautiful highs and the most tormented lows of our life. So relationships are the pillars and the backbone of our existence. The pillar, this pillar explains that relationships are like a garden. You have to cultivate them. Once you get them up and running, the maintenance to keep them growing is much easier. And time, effort and imagination must be summoned to constantly keep any relationship flourishing. So don't neglect people. Don't neglect your, your wife. <laughs> don't neglect your husband. People say that money makes the world go round, but Ron believed that relationships are what makes the world go round because things get done through people. And achieve your goals. This is pillar four. So the pillars achieve your goals I've heard and read many times that you should write your goals down. And this is what I believe. Writing them down brings them into reality. A side benefit of achieving your goals is that you become a better person. The major reason for setting a goal is for what it makes of you to accomplish it. Something I learned from someone elsewhere is the plans will change, but your goals will stay the same a good approach for checking what progress is. Plan, do, check, adjust. So the proper use of time. So there are two types of pain. The pain of discipline, which weighs only ounces. The pain of regret, which weighs tons. Don't procrastinate. The end of your life will come sooner than you expect. Don't wait until it's too late. And remember, that when you spend a day, you have one less day to spend each day, so spend each day wisely. And every day has many opportunities, but only one best opportunity. The best opportunities are those when you align your off with your overall, go overall goals and know the difference between the urgent and more important. So surround yourself with the best people. And that is a, is a, is a real thing really important thing I found. Pillar six, so this is pillar six. Don't join any easy crowd. You want to grow. Go where expectations and the demands to perform are high and people have amazing power to influence your destiny. Every relationship you have is an association. It must be positive, neutral or negative. And categorize every person you meet. It sounds awful, but is he or she someone you should 
disassociate with, have limited association with, or should you expand your association? Surround yourself with winners, successful people who exhibit and live in constant, uh, sorry, in consistent to values and the skills you want to acquire and develop. You become like those you hang out with. So be picky, be picky who you hang around with. And be a lifelong learner. This is pillar seven. Most of your life is lived after formal education. Formal education will make you a living. Self-education will make you a fortune. Self-education is about what you teach yourself and what you learn along the way so you are constantly improving and growing. And learning is the beginning of wealth, health and spirituality. Read books, observe successful people, reflect on your own experiences and learn what went right and what went wrong. Help others by sharing what you've learned. And sales is influence. So sales means influence and influence is the key to a successful life. Learn the art and skill of influence. One key to having influence with others is to have others perceive you as a person of talent and virtue. Your talent and virtues represent your character and skill. So be a person of strong character and increasing skill and you will always be growing your influence. Life is sales. And income is seldom exceeds personal development. So pillar nine is money doesn't solve the problems of your life. You can lose it, be sued for it, or it can be stolen. What's more important is you become uh, what you become because what you become directly influences what you get. Become a million dollar person. Remember, even if you lose all the money in the world, you've got the skills to earn that money back again. So income seldom exceeds personal development. And there we are, all communication brings the common ground of understanding. All of us coming together, we've all got the common understanding. We're 10 speakers, six continents, one industry. We came together. So pillar 10, communication is two or more people working together, or 10. Find the common ground, understanding where they find the common ground, they are positioned to have tremendous power together. Communication is hard. Yeah, we've heard with this listening exercise. Yet important in all relationships. It's about what you say, how you say it, when you say it, and the receptiveness of those you say it to. So make sure you really listen. The character behind listening is caring enough and valuing the other person enough to know, enough, enough to want to listen. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And all communication brings a common ground of understanding. And the world can always use one more great leader. So this is pillar 11. Anyone can be a great leader. All it takes is mastering the art of influence. Leaders make a difference through servanthood. To lead others is to help them change their thoughts, beliefs, and actions for the better. Be interested in people, not just in what you can get from them. And help people with more than just their jobs. Help them with their lives. And great leaders are real. They know where they are. Great leaders have an optimistic vision. They know how to get to a better destination and work towards that vision. The world can always use one more great leader. And lastly is leave a legacy. So this is pillar 12. Life is short. You can't choose how long you will live but you can choose how well you will live. Live a life that will help others spiritually, intellectually, physically, financially, and build relationships. So it's a life that serves as an example of what an exceptional life can look like. The path we walk has been prepared for us by others who have gone before us. Okay? So live your life in such a way that it will serve those who come after you blaze a trail that will allow others to move forward in their lives faster than if they had to blaze the trail themselves. So these are the pillars of success. 
So I've gone through them, um, you know, and it's a fantastic book. I'd recommend uh, reading the book. It's, a, it's quite a short book. And Jason, what's the name of the book, please? So it's called, uh, it's called 12 Pillars, The 12 Pillars of Success. I'll just write it down as well. Yeah, fine. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. So in conclusion, so as you can see, the 12 pillars are just interdependent. You can't just focus on one of, one of these and neglect the others. The bottom line is that you have to have a choice about your life, make a living or, or a designer life. So, um, I hope you find the value in these pillars um, and you'll be inspired to pick up 12 pillars and apply the pillars to your life and business. Absolutely. So, I'm, I'm, so, so essentially, it's, it's, you, you're all responsible for your own life and you should be designing the life that you want. And this is just from the, my mentoring site, you know, it's what we believe in. So we strongly believe your goals, no matter how colossal and overwhelming they are, will predominantly be achieved through working smarter, not harder. So uh, having the guidance of a mentor in your life is crucial, as throughout history, mentoring has proven to be critical and essential to the success of the most influential people, as we saw at the start of the presentation. Having a mentor is not merely about being given advice in regards to your career as perceived by numerous people. In fact, we believe that your personal and professional goals and aspirations always align. Hence, a mentor is responsible for helping you develop traits which become daily habits so you can enjoy life on your terms. Now, I'm conscious of time, so I'm just going to kind of sum summarize this before we go on to um, onto the future of architecture. But so what are the habits of highly effective people? And I'll just go through these and you can, again, you can buy this book. There's a book um, you can buy for this. So keys to success. So um, question. Yeah, it's, it's, it, this, is a, this is a question I just want to ask um, you don't have to provide the answer but just ask this question of yourself so what, what what does everyone in the room want to do with their career these are questions you should be asking yourself do you have a goal for that career and have you written down that goal and do you have a vision for what you really want to achieve these are the questions you should be asking yourself daily so the seven habits um, which is it's by a book called Stephen Colvey, believe that they are seven habits that, you sh that highly effective people use and you should be using these daily. daily. And I'm just going to rattle through these very, very quickly. So be proactive. Are you a proactive person? Begin with the end in mind. Put first things first. Think win-win. Seek first to understand, then be understood. Synergize, the whole is the sum of the parts, and sharpen the saw. And if you look at this book, and I can kind of take you through these, but I will just skim, I'll just skim through these. Yes, okay, Jason, you can, you can take your time, no problem, yeah? Yeah, it's, it, if, if, you should, if you're sure, I can go through. So, yes, so, let me just, what I will do, can I uh, bring, because we've got a bit of time, we've got, you know, yeah. 15 minutes in front, I don't want you to rush it because we are learning so much. And okay. I want to bring, um, I want to bring Lyra in. So Lyra, can you uh, put your video on, please? Uh, because we really want to go through everything that you've got there. So uh, we don't okay. want to rush it. We've got 15 more minutes. And uh, Lyra, can you join us, please? Okay. And if you can put your video as well, because I've got some questions and then we'll uh, formally introduce Lyra. So have a breather, um, Jason, and then I will get back to your slide shortly. And I'm just gonna uh, introduce Lyra formally. And then before we have few questions, and then we we'll continue with the presentation. So uh, I just wanna, uh, before I present Lyra, can everybody see my video, please? Yes, fantastic. And I'm just going to uh, have um, Jason um, have a breather. Lyra, you can put your video in if you, if you want, no problem. And I'm just going to share um, that with you guys. Just to set the tone. I can hear you. Yeah. 
So I want to put this video before I formally introduce yourself. So Davison, can you see that video okay? Okay, yep. off we go. All right, um, here we go. So one sec. I have a number of mentors. My formal mentor, we meet on a regular basis and we discuss my development plan. I am a first time mentor. I've been a mentor to a number of different women. It's exciting to see people grow. I absolutely enjoy that. I feel like I'm learning as much from the process and from my mentee as I hope she's learning from me. She's given me a lot of great advice. You walk into a meeting, um, you know, take a seat at the table. Be a humble, but strong leader. A good mentor is also someone who has a good network. I didn't necessarily understand right away. He was kind of hard on me, as I think a good mentor would be. He pushed me. They see the potential in you that you may not see in yourself. But he was also my biggest cheerleader. You just find someone that you really enjoy working with or you respect or you admire and you like their leadership style. I think that's a great way to find a mentor. Ask that person, they're probably gonna be very flattered and hopefully they'll have time to um, have a relationship with you to mentor you. Okay, so I want to just uh, get our guest presenter from USA. So, um, Lara, can you, are you okay to put your video? Just making um, sure. You would need to turn it up from your side. Can you? Yes, let me just see if I can ask you to start video. So, I'm asking you to start your video. So, if you just say yes there. Awesome. So, uh, hi everybody. Yes, we can see you, we can hear you, we can see your beautiful um, red blouse, if, I, if, I, if that's the correct word. Uh, can you put your hands up please for Lyra from Chicago in USA. Uh, this was a surprise to everybody. Lyra has just become a fellow of the RIBA and, you know, Jason was part of the mentoring process. So, I want to introduce everybody. Um, to, uh, to everybody as a guest presenter, Lyra. Lyra Lewis, former an architecture career for the benefit of others through research and innovation. Um, as fellow for Tylazin Architect Limited, she revived the underutilized system built home, Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation Project that birthed his Usonian Jacob House, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, resulting in reduction of plight in disadvantaged city block of New Jersey. Her research and development of LeapFrog Project, Living Bold, enables self-sufficient empowerment of extreme weather survivors through geodesic construction. In her magnetic levitation experiment, she developed new architectural solution to help island nation overcome rapidly rising sea level. She mentors young women and minorities about 3D printing, architecture technology and licensure at Northwestern University, which is the University of Chicago, uh, Westwood College and Scott, Scottsdale Community College, including UN 2013 Youth Force. In 2010, she received the American Institute of Architecture Athena Young Professional Leadership Award for contributing time and energy to improving the community quality of life and actively assisting others particularly women, in realizing their full leadership potential. And this year, put your hands up please for RIB elected her as the 2020 fellow. And as you mentioned, you only get eight fellows during the year. And, um, you know, Lyra is one of those eight, you know, you know great uh, architect in the world. So um, before we get Jason in, maybe you can do your presentation. We'll take some questions and then Jason can get back on it. So, uh, Lyra, I'm gonna share your uh, presentation and then you can take that through, yeah? So, I'm just gonna- So, thank you. Yes, good morning and good evening to you. Good morning to me. Thank you, Anil and Jason, for uh, this opportunity to engage with your audience all over the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great honor and opportunity to be part of this conversation about mentoring and about the, uh, the process towards fellowship. So in, in some of my projects and in listening to Jason's earlier presentation, he mentioned about, uh, you know, how, how you mentor people. So the kind of mentoring I did 
is um, similar to to helping others. But in this case, so if if you pull up the slide, it's coming up. Um, my slide. I actually mentored my clients, and how did I do this? So my work is about uh, helping people, or I advance work for those um, impacted by extreme climate and inequities. So in this picture, you will see um, some of the, you know, the the on the, on the left side of the photo. Um, here, I'm gonna put the arrow or my mouse here. Um, this is the one of the extreme natural disaster survivors for category five typhoon high end. And how did I apply mentorship in this? So there is always that preconception when you're trying to help people like this and you come in as an architect or a builder or to that effect, a contractor. Uh, they, they immediately think, oh, we can't afford you or we can't help you. And so then that's one of the things that I needed to overcome. And then on my side, for my industry, the architects, um, I needed to overcome the preconception that there's no benefit for me as an architect by helping these people. As you can see, um, the next picture on the right side of it, I mentored uh, these people. I taught have them how to build line. geodesic. Lyra, can, yes. I give you, can I give you control for the mouse? So I'm just going to give you the control so then you can show. Yes. Can you see uh, yes. if you can accept the control screen so then you can, I'm giving you access for using your mouse. Can you, can you just click on it? Yeah. Yeah, so, so now, awesome. um, on, so I'm pointing at this uh, to the right of it. So this geodesic construction was actually built by these people the extreme natural disaster survivors. And would you believe this? We started building this in the morning by five o'clock PM on the same day. People like them who have never heard of a geodesic construction or who have never studied about structural engineering built this. So that's a total of eight hours. We were using bamboo, which was indigenous to the site. And so this is an example of um, what I, I learned from this too is that when you teach people a vision, share them a vision, no matter how complicated it is, but when you explain it to them in a way that they would understand it, because I related it to a similar lantern, a form of lantern construction that was popular in the Philippines, they could easily pick up, pick up the concept and learn from it quickly. And so then this is the product of that uh, process, you know, the mentoring process with extreme natural disaster survivors. So in this day and age, all of us around the world are experiencing this pandemic. So during the past month, um, what we were doing remotely, working from home, you know, uh, working together but separately, is we took that same concept of this geodesic construction where um, the diameter of this is about I would say nine feet, or that would be around four meters in diameter, and scaled it down to apply a design for a headpiece or a mask that could be used by those, not the first responders, but everyone else who are staying at home, sheltering in place, or those who are in quarantine when they do essential errands, that they could use it as a protection, as an alternative to a mask. And these are the initial sketch. Um, this is the initial sketch, the studies that we've been doing. And it's based on the organic principles that imp implements a lot of the cross ventilation. It's currently in production. So I did a first prototype, as you can see, using um, uh, opaque materials, but just testing the size of it, if we could scale it down. But the final product of that face mask, which is you know, to be used during this pandemic, would be transparent with uh, help of HEPA filters on you know surrounding the the piece. So again, this is a demonstration of how you know mentoring is not just limited to your career. It could apply to really any aspect of your your life, your projects, even your clients. And at the bottom is you know one of the projects that I did also currently in process is the magnetic levitation. It's a solution for addressing rising sea levels. So again, 
uh, we exhibited uh, a smaller prototype of this, but mentoring and engaging the audience of that conference, um, as you can see, these people were trying to learn playing around with the concept of these magnetic levitations and engaging with it. Um, and, and that's one of the ways that you know, you could also apply mentoring is random people who attend a conference, you wanna teach them about um, or, or create awareness on rising sea levels. This is how we sent the message across. So in a nutshell, um, what I learned from this whole mentoring process through the projects that I've been doing and through these experiments is that mentorship is not limited to yourself you know, to mentors within your industry. It could also translate to your clients and to other people that you actually engage on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's, um, in a nutshell, what that mentorship process and the process of doing these experiments um, have given me as we work towards this. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. I'm just gonna take wow. control of the mouse. Uh, Jason, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I, I think I think you can you can just see why Lara, um, you know, is has got fellowship. You know, uh, fantastic innovation, uh, collaboration. Um, she's probably um, you know top on all of them twelve pillars we were talking about. You know, she's embraced that. Awesome. Uh, and, and Jason, what do you think about? You know, I think you talk about patent as well, like copyright. Uh, I think that's something it, it could be really useful for the future. Yeah, absolutely. I hope I hope Lyra's going to um, patent that because it's uh, it's it's fantastic and it's been designed by an architect. So, yeah. Love wow! It. Awesome! Awesome! Can we put a big hand of applause for Lyra from USA to come up with this? And I'm sure you guys will be connecting with Lyra on LinkedIn. Uh, she's very active on Twitter as well, as, as Jason mentioned as well. So thank you for this. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to, I think it's good to have you now because I'm going to ask, I've got lots of questions from uh, the participants because I want to obviously listen to all the presentation as well. So I've got lots of questions coming in. The first question is, Jason, who mentored Jason Boyle? <laughs> yeah, okay. So I can give you a good answer to that one. Um, and uh, it shows my age. So there was a guy called Tony Wilson uh, from Manchester who um, owned the Hacienda nightclub. Um, he managed bands New Order, uh, Happy Mondays, um, you know, so he, and he was also a TV presenter on uh, our local uh, Manchester sort of TV. So he, he was quite a big character and I sort of got to know him towards the end of his life, the sort of last 10 years, um, when he came into the practice in Manchester. So we became friends. He's, he's such an inspiring person. Um, nothing to do with architecture. You know, he was in the music industry and he sort of taught, taught everything um, about passion of life and about being effective and productive. So, yeah. Wow. Um, so thank you for this, um, Jason. Uh, I'm just going to move to Lyra. Who mentored you uh, and who was your mentor? So there were a series, like I mean, every stage of my life, there's a series of people who mentored me. There were people who mentored me when I was in undergrad architecture school, but the people that created an impact for me, you know, on me, was the people who actually mentored me when I was still at Frank Lloyd Wright's um, Taliesin. So Taliesin is a Welsh term that means uh, shining brow, but it's an apprenticeship program that was started by Frank Lloyd Wright. And of course, um, towards uh, my, my journey, the topic of this uh, CPD is the journey to fellowship. So I reached out to Jason uh, and, and I, I think, you know, people these days, especially in the days of social distancing, and you can see here the effectiveness that it is possible to find mentors online. And I reached out to Jason. Um, my first interaction was through LinkedIn. Um, I reached out to him, explained to him my goal of um, trying to become a fellow of the RIBA. And I think what's important is to find people 
who already reached the goal that you're trying to reach. And I saw that Jason was already a fellow of the RIBA and reached out to him. He gave me some advice on my portfolio and my submission and the insights, which I took to heart. And as you can see, the result of it is that I got elevated as a fellow as well. Okay, uh, I've got plenty of questions. It's great to have this um, Q&A session right now. There's a question from Rahul and he's from Mauritius. Is being fellowship the mountain top? So is being fellowship is really the top? I'll start with you, Jason. Few words on that before I move to Lyra. Yeah, just a few words. I think it's, um, it, it is if, if, you, if you're in the sort of, um, you're quite young in your, in your career, I would say. So, you know, I think it should be given to people who excel um, sort of midway through their career because they can use it to really um, inspire other people. Um, so yeah, it is, it is because of such a small number of people actually attain it. Um, it's kind of seen as, um, yeah, being, okay. being uh, the pinnacle, yeah. Lara, what's your views quickly on that? Is fellowship being so, the peak of your career? Well, what, uh, what inspired me actually to pursue the RIBA fellowship is that I saw in the examples of Jason, and then there was another um, RIBA fellow that I, from Austin, Texas, and I read his blog about his journey, is that it's not, um, while it is you know, considered one of the pinnacles probably of your career, but it's not an end to it, it's just the beginning. And yeah. Jason also emphasizes to me when um, he found out the good news that um, I got elevated as a fellow. And that's also what attracted me to apply or pursue the RIBA fellowship. They were very clear in their program um, and, and from the start. And if you, you, you'll check it, uh, you'll see it in their website that this is just the beginning. This is not, you know, your lifetime achievement award where, you know, you could like sit on your laurels. So it's actually, it would inspire you to keep going and that's to me that's the most important part of receiving fellowship is that you continue it's an inspiration for you to continue okay i've got another question very important one um and this is coming from nigeria uh the question is from our friend from nigeria is fellowship nation sensitive i mean as a nigerian in nigeria without schooling in the uk can you become a fellow of the RIBA? I'll, I'll get that question to Jason. Um, it's, I think it's um, for the RIBA, yes, you've got to be an RIBA member, um, and which Lyra is. Um, but I think um, in its wider context, I think most professional institutions around the world um, have some form of fellowship. Or if they haven't got that, then they should definitely consider um, you know, a fellowship. I don't know if you want to come on, on back on that one, Lyra. Lyra, what's your thoughts? Yes. So, you know, I think one of, I, I'm an example because I was originally born in the Philippines. So I would say this to anybody anywhere in the world. You know, I, if, if you ask me when I was still in undergrad school, is there a possibility for me to become a fellow of the RIBA? And maybe at that point, I would think it would be impossible for me. I was, my undergrad was not in the US. So I took my master's degree at the Franklin Rice School of Architecture, which is in the US. However, I think it is possible for you to become an RIBA fellow, you know, that it's really dependent on the impact that you're doing, whether it's in your community or, um, you know, in a, in a global setting, but the impact and the ripple effect of that impact. So it doesn't, location, where you study doesn't really matter. And I would say that don't use that as a barrier or a hindrance for you to pursue it. But one of the criteria is first, of course, you have to be a member of that, yeah. whatever organization you're trying to become uh, a fellow. You have to be a member. However, your education, your accomplishments is regardless of where you're located in the world. 
Yeah, thank you very much because we have lots of architects, great architects watching us from Mauritius as well today. So thank you to all the other, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna touch on that. There's a question from Ethiopia, from Addis. And Addis is saying, you, you know, is mentoring the same thing as, you know, like in RIB or RICS, which is I am, a, I'm a counselor. Is mentoring and counseling the same thing or is there fine differences? Uh, Jason, you start with yourself. Yeah, th I mean, th there's, there's another term as well. Coaching um, is, uh, is, is kind of seen as um, also part of mentoring. I think counseling is, is not mentoring. So uh, we, we're not counselors at all. Um, that's my personal view. Um, we are sort of more um, coaching. Um, but, but, but I'd just like to say, you know, the mentoring I sort of uh, really um, think is important is a holistic mentoring not just your sort of work life. And so I think Lara, Lara, Lara's probably got a, a view. Lara, well. what's your, what's your, because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a counselor for my own institution, but I play the role of a mentor more because it's also partly, you know, mentoring people, you know, on social life, putting pressure, uh, advising them on mental health, emotional intelligence and what have you. So I find myself more of a mentor as opposed to a counselor. What's your views on that one? So for me, um, what was effective for me is that um, there are struggles, there are issues that I deal with on a professional level and then on a personal level in, in my work life um, and in my personal life. So I seek out different people who would give me sound advice on, on those aspects. So yes, I agree that um, counseling is different from mentorship. However, I also think that what was effective for me was that um, it depends on what I'm trying to do. If I'm trying to solve a personal problem, I seek out a counselor. If I'm trying to pursue a certain goal for my career, then I, I reach out to a person who already reached what I'm trying to reach and then seek out advice from those people. And then if I'm trying to say, look for a job or have a career transition, and I, so I tried to reach out again or look for people who could give me sound advice about the industry I'm trying to get into. So I think, you know, it's, it, it's a matter of finding different people, finding mentors um, or coaches who could actually give you input or insight on whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. However, it's important to distinguish between is it a personal issue or is it a professional issue or is it a, um, a career goal issue? Okay, uh, we'll take one more question before we move to Jason, you know, 20 minute presentation and then we'll have the last 10 minutes for Q&A again. There's a very interesting question about what is next after fellowship? Is it preferable to get it around 35 years old or 45 years old? What's your views on that? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I got mine at 45. So uh, <laughs> yeah, you know my answer. Um, I think, you, you know, it, it's tricky within architecture to get um, fellowship um, maybe at 35. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's, it's because it, it does take um, seven, um, you know, seven or more years to actually qualify. Um, but um, it's not impossible. And I would just say, you know, that the, the, you need that experience, but, but by surrounding yourself with, uh, like Lyra said, with very other successful people, seeking out maybe different mentors at different stages is a perfect way to sort of elevate yourself and get yourself noticed, um, you know? So I don't uh, know if that answers the question. Lyra, uh, any, anything from you in terms of, is, is it 35, 45, 55, or 25? What's your views on that? I think the fellowship is not really dependent on your age. It's dependent on when you're ready. So, and if, and if you're confident about the experiences and the accomplishments that you have and the impact that you've done and you feel that you're ready, it's really, it doesn't matter if you're 35 or 45, I should say, you know, just go for it and see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to take one more question from a young engineer who's coming through. Uh, she's from Mauritius, um, uh, Mokshita. So my question is, how can one pave the way to success in this world full of competition? 
we know that competition can be toxic. So, you know, um, just quickly a few words of advice. I know this is a very interesting question, but it could be a very large one. How, what would advice would you give to the young engineer, um, a, a young, you know, women engineer about, you know, we know that competition can be toxic. What are the advice in terms of trying to be with the competition or go along with Jason? Yeah, it's, it's, you're always going to have competition in any stage of your career. Um, you know, it's, it, I guess it's just about, um, you know, having these, these small adjustments, making these small adjustments every, every day and, and thinking and planning and using your time effectively. If you, if you sort of practice um, these sort of things and be self-aware of what you're, what you're doing in your career, um, you're going to give yourself the best possible chance. But, you know, surround yourself with other successful people is a top tip, I would say. Um, Lyra? As, as far as competition, I think, you know, you would uh, better be better off if you, you compete with yourself. Meaning, every time you reach a goal, you have to compete with yourself. You have to outdo that goal that you just completed rather than comparing what you've done with your competition or with other people, just focus on yourself and then try to outdo the next one, try to outdo the next one that you did. And, and that way, you know, you won't have to worry about any other competition, but just yourself. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I've got one more question from another engineer. Um, um, mentoring is dependent on culture. Developing countries have a different culture of mentoring compared to developed co countries. So developing countries has a different culture of mentoring compared to developed countries. How far do you agree? Uh, I'll start with Lyra on this one. So how far do you agree in yeah. terms of the, the style of mentoring with different type of developing countries and developed? Correct. So I agree with that and I see where they're coming from because I, like I mentioned, I studied my undergrad in architecture in the Philippines and they have a different culture. It's not a developed country. And then I moved for my master's degree in the US to developed country. So I struggled with that transition because the approach of those, my professors, in the Philippines and my professors in the US had this slightly different culture. And of course, approaching me as somebody of a different culture as well. So that's the challenge there. However, I did find that if you really seek people, there are people who you will align with and find those people. There are people who will, um, who will help you because my mentor, as I mentioned at the Franklin Rice School of Architecture, they were not from my same culture. The person who gave me advice on my fellowship, Jason is not from my same culture. There are people who could you know, pull you or push you to your um, to, to possibilities that that are beyond your what you think that you are capable of. Okay, thank you. I've got a question from South Africa. Um, how do you classify the people you meet? So how do you categorize them? I mean, do you you know are you picky in who you meet and connect on LinkedIn to ensure that you you know, nurture your growth in line with those people, in line with your profession, Jason? Oh, that's, that's, that's a tough one. I think um, maybe that question's come from one of the earlier presentations I said. It's, I, think what, I think what I mean by this sort of thing is, um, you know, you got, you've, got only got, you've only got limited time, so you need to, um, um, if you really want to advance in your career, surrounding yourself with other successful people or people who don't suck your energy and i think we all know who then those people are um can help you um it's a, it's a difficult question to to really answer um but i think it's uh, using your instincts you know instinctively you should really know who is um going to be um good for you so lyra and then for me, I, you know, when I meet people or when I interact pe with people online, so I, I categorize them like mentally, is this person going to be an anchor or an engine? So what do I mean by an anchor? So when you're in a boat, you know, you drop your anchor, meaning because you want to stop, right? You want to just stay there. And an engine for a car, for example, an engine propels you to move forward. 
And so then that's my cue. So I analyze my interactions, whether, okay, is this person going to be an engine, whether it's for my personal growth or my professional growth, or is this person going to be an anchor? Meaning is this going, is this person going, or my interactions with this person, is it going to hold me down or, you know, not force me to grow? So I think that's the cue that I, um, that I use in analyzing my interactions. So that's I take great, one more that's question. That's a great way of putting it. <laughs> yes. Uh, I want to take one more question before we conclude, because we'd love to hear you for your presentation to finish off. So uh, our last question before we get to Jason's presentation and we'll go back to final. We've got about 25 minutes left. So J Jason and Lyra, both of you. So I'll start with Lyra on this one. Do you find mentoring frustrating at times? So like sometimes you have mentee who's, you know, struggling and do you find it, you know, be honest in terms of do you find it, you know, sometimes tiring uh, and, you know, you need to go to that extra level to get to where you want to be? Yeah, so I find that mentoring, you know, for it to be effective, it needs to be fluid, meaning people, you, you encounter people, and I've experienced this too in whether, you know, from my professors in the Philippines or in Asia, or from my professors in the U.S. or um, anywhere in, um, in, in the U.S. or Europe, North America. So it, it, it doesn't really matter the location. However, I experienced the same thing, wherein what I, what I found most effective is that if the mentoring was fluid, meaning um, your line of thought, your wavelength, and um, your values, are the same then the mentorship becomes a natural thing it flows out naturally and then I find um, when when I encounter people whose values do not align with me or my values don't align with them then it becomes a challenge which is what you described in the question so although I don't you know shy away from those types of mentoring I actually um, seek them out because it helps me learn something about myself that I don't, you know, that maybe I am missing to see. But it is challenging and you will encounter those, but you will also encounter people, you know, who, who will mentor you or you will mentor people that are effortless. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jason, to finish on that one before we move on to your presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just, and, just. And, and Jason as well, just to let the uh, um, uh, participant know that you mentor people all around the world um, lots of architects in the UK and around the world. Quickly, yeah. do you find it frustrating sometimes because of different um, abilities? If you yeah, like? yeah, like, we're only human. Um, you know, we, it is frustrating at times. Um, you know, and not every not every sort of person. You know, it's, it's like a relationship when you're mentoring someone, and it, it might I might not be suitable for that person, and you've just got to be honest and say. It's just not. It's just not working. And um, but they they might be with another mentor, and it works absolutely fine. It's just about being completely open and honest. Um, but you know, I do try and not to give up. I do try and find a way that can make it work. Okay, I've got one more question before we because I think this is really good. Uh, this is uh, a friend of uh, mine, Arvin from Conakry, uh, Guinea, in West Africa. Conakry, uh, Guinea. And he's saying about what was challenging in your fellowship. So what was the difficult part? Was it the writing? Was it the inspiration? What was difficult to really get that fellowship? Starting with uh, Jason on that one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely trying to, um, you know, you only have so many words. I think it's like 250 words per, per, every, um, per category. And it's three out of the five. So it's condensing um, what you've actually, um, what you've been doing your, in your career into 250 words. That's, that, that, that was the challenge I, I kind of found. Um, you know, I don't know if it was different for you, Lyra. Well, the, the most challenging for me was actually the verification of those projects that I submitted and my contribution in those projects. Because then you're talking about, you know, reaching out, some of them, the projects have already completed. And then now I have to search for those people. And then of course, memory, you know, the lag in memory, 
do they remember that you really contributed that to that project and you have to show them proof and it's a good thing for my end i had um, documentation that it was published so it was in in, in 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 an article in a news article so then there's that proof and then then they would be happy to verify your contribution on that project so that was the challenging part and of course you know writing and how you present it how you would tell that story to a jury that you've never met and who doesn't know you wow thank you so jason let's do 15 minutes of your presentation um to conclude uh, your presentation and then we will get back to just final i've got five more questions uh, the questions are coming in but uh, let's okay. uh, we've got about 20 minutes so if you can just do your final on your i think i'm really enjoying it so i don't want to you know just yeah um, yeah i'll do it. i'll do this as, as, as quick as possible yes please okay, yeah so uh, yeah. lara if you can switch off your video for now and then um, okay. i will uh, and then we will just get jason to present before we take the another we've got 15 to 20 minutes before we conclude this we've got 150 of you attending right now so thank you everybody for being here and i'm really enjoying that so i don't want to i want to get the most out of jason jason all yours great okay you can see that screen yeah yes we can see the screen okay. perfect can you put your hands up please if you everybody can see the screen of jason yeah fantastic so everybody's putting their hands up okay it's all working so it's so habit one are you a proactive person or a reactive person um um how do you so you know what is what is being proactive it might sound like a silly question but they they, they definitely are um traits to this so in order to be proactive you must first develop foresight so proactive people foresee potential obstacles and exert their power to find ways to un overcome them before those obstacles turn into roadblocks you know that that's that's foresight and, and, and the way you sort of do that is to plan and proactive people also plan for the future. You participate and you perform. So these are all traits of being a proactive person. And then habit two is always starting with this end in mind. So this is about having the vision. So you need a mental, you need to have a mental creation before the physical creation can be formed so habits one and two come together as daily habits moment to moment this is the mindset and then it's manifested a manifestation is meaning is an indication of the existence reality or presence of something so habit three put first things first so putting first thing first means having self-awareness and knowing yourself, your priorities, your values, mission, vision, dreams, and taking actions towards those each day. So every day you're working towards these. And the framework I'm going to share with you is to help put these first things first. So it's called the time management matrix. You can Google this. It's basically a simple box where how many people in, the, in, in the, their sort of day-to-day -day life will do box four? So they'll do the not important and not urgent thing first. So, 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 so I start my day, believe it or not, I put the urgent and the important into box one and not urgent and important into box two. And you just categorize um, uh, things in your life and you tackle the urgent and important things. It might sound quite simple, but it's a very effective way of managing your time. So habit four, think win-win. So win-win seems life as a cooperative arena, not a competitive one. Win-win is a frame of mind. So it's about the heart that constantly seeks mutual benefit in all human interactions. So what win-win means is agreements or solutions are mutually beneficial and satisfying. Think of it as we both get to eat the pie. So when we're in a, uh, when we're, buying a car or something we both want to feel like we've won you want to get a good deal the salesman wants to get a good deal you both want to sort of win and that's the sort of mentality so the win win approach to negotiation you can read about this but the key points are is focus on maintaining the relationship when you're having that discussion with people separate the people from the problem focus on interests not positions Generate a variety of options that offer gains to both parties before deciding what to do. 
So you both want this to be mutually beneficial. And the aim is for the result to be based on an objective standard. So you've got to focus on maintaining that relationship. So not allowing the disagreement you might have, um, damaging this personal relationship. Don't blame others for the problems um, and confront, being confrontational. And this can only involve actively supporting the other individuals while confronting the problem. And that's what win-win is. So habit five, seek to understand, then to be understood. So most people do not listen with the intent to be understood. They listen with the intent to reply. How many people do you meet who do this? You know, you're not really listening to me. So it's likely that naturally you seek first to be understood. So we are often so intent on getting our points across in a conversation that we only partially listen to what the other participants are saying, like on that listening exercise we did. And in doing so, we are not truly communicating, which leads to confusion, mixed messages, and a lack of clarity. This is not good communication. So please listen empathetically. Listen, listening empathetically is listening without jumping to one of the four responses. And that's agreeing, disagreeing, asking often loaded questions, advising and interpreting the situation in your way. So synergy is better than my way or your way. It's our way. So habit six, synergize. The whole is the sum of the parts. So a synergy is where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. In other words, when two or more people or organizations combine their efforts, they can accomplish more together than they can separately. So you're collaborating. They can get more done working together when they can, when they're working apart. And it's not only a part, but the, most, but the most catalytic, the most empowering, the most unifying, the most exciting part is the combination of highly emotional bank accounts, as he calls it. So you're thinking win-win and seeking first to understand creates the ideal environment for, to have synergy. And habit seven, this is called sharpening the saw. So the example here is if I had six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. How many people get their tools out and start on a job without actually making sure the tools fit for its job? Abraham Lincoln. Awesome quote. So, if, so, so we're just there um, near the end. So if you're overworking yourself, and your productivity begins to fall off and we're all there every day. So common wisdom says to take a break, go on holiday. So that's kind of sharpening the saw. It's not really, that's putting the saw down. When you put down a dull blade for a while, the blade will be dull. And then when you pick it up again, it's still dull. So sharpening the saw is actually an activity just as the analogy, an analogy suggests, think about what it would mean to sharpen the saw of your life. Here are some of the sharpening ideas, okay? So exercise, improving your diet, educating yourself, read, listen to audio programs, attend a seminar, learn a new skill, join a club, meditate, write in your journal, and having a deep conversation with someone. I think Lyra was, was saying a similar thing, is once you've um, achieved something, keep on achieving, keep pushing yourself forward. So then this is the final bit, and it's just gonna be one video, which I thought I'd share with you. So what should young architects do? So um, I'm just talking about um, architects here, but it could relate to any other construction professionals. So we're gonna to have to collaborate much more and work, um, and maybe we could work alongside gamers, drone pilots, fabricators, robot operators. Um, we need to collaborate much more in design with technology. And there's a great example I'm gonna show you now. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we can hear the sound, no problem. Right.
Today we're in the Construction Platforms Research Centre at a place called Rockwell. It's actually a, a farm, but a farm that I think is going to be a catalyst. It's Can you increase your volume a little bit, Jason? Today we've been showcasing some work that we've been done. The vision was okay. how can we take the construction of a commercial office building and break it down into a kit of parts we could deliver onto a site and assemble rather than construct a building in a traditional way. So what we've got to do is take the pre-casting techniques and bring them to site. What we're doing here effectively is we're trying to develop what we call the productive routine, so the processes that people can repeat time after time safely on site uh, and efficiently, which drives uh, productivity. So the Transforming Construction Challenge is there to help the sector change the way it works. And this project, it's almost a, an ideal example of the kinds of things we want to see. We want to see a kit of parts approach coming forward, a platform approach to buildings, taking a manufacturing uh, discipline to construction so that we are changing the processes. The prototyping has been key in being able to prove that those ideas are practical and really work and to build the confidence both in ourselves as a client and in the construction industry partners that we would use to build a full-scale project. This project just it takes out so much of the, the interface problems that have caused so much trouble in the past. It just uses intelligent techniques like not lifting up the really heavy stuff or not transporting the really heavy stuff miles and miles and then craning it into place making a set of very standardized lightweight components put together really easily with, with low manpower and then pumping in the concrete at the last minute. So our involvement in this project has been as the design development team alongside Bridenwood and the prototype builders. This is the third platform. Platform one was for uh, smaller spans. Platform two, uh, again, that were a larger span, uh, and that was for residential, which got companies like Landsec who were wanting to improve how they build their offices. Uh, offices need a larger span than what platform two can offer, so naturally we called it platform three, given larger spans. So for us, delivering the kind of targets we wanted to see in terms of faster delivery of projects, lower cost, greater productivity so we can produce more with the same workforce uh, and producing emissions and improving the whole life value of uh, the buildings. It's important that we don't just get time and cost savings, we need to do things better and we need to do things safer. It reduces the amount of people or workers that have to be on site, so that means that it reduces the risk in terms of having accidents and incidents. gone from the sort of laboratory um, into the real world and the real world is, is now really you know we've been on site at Summer Street um, and ready to start construction um, in the early part of 2020 so getting all of that learning and applying it straight away is fantastic. It's always hard to innovate, it always feels risky and the team have, have marched through all of that and achieved a huge amount and we really have line of sight now to, to executing on this first building down in Southwark to then take it on to, to the next, to the next, to the next. There are tremendous opportunities to improve productivity and construction. So, you know, unlike other industries which now are making incremental gains, we've got this opportunity to really leap forward in terms of productivity. You have one of the UK's largest companies working with one of the UK's smallest companies with probably one of its most innovative design organisations that have come together to really produce something that we hope will start to change the way that buildings are designed, delivered and constructed. Okay, that was really, really good, uh, excellent video there. To say, just want to say, so Bryden Wood um, Architects, um, but they, they're kind of leading the way with the FMA and they, they're looking at um, some great performance figures, you know. Um, so, you know, we've, we're in this world now where we're possibly going into a recession. 
And, and, and so, Jason, just a quick one for the participant. What is the FMA? So it's designed for manufacture and assembly. So okay. essentially utilizing that BIM model, that digital model, which we're all now uh, mandated to use in the UK, and then taking that into a manufacturing space. So looking at every bit of the parts, so the kit of parts and assembling that on site. So, you, so you, you're getting no wastage, you're getting faster productivity and, and you can see they've built like um, a sort of mock-up of it to test it. So the idea is you'll build part of that building using them kit, kit of parts and then you'll take it to an expensive site in London where you, you want to reduce the time spent on site and um, the machinery to put it together um, and, and just get much faster, quicker results. Okay. And that's, that's what they're doing. So that's, that's the future of architecture, I think, in the next um, um, five to 10 years. I think manufacturing buildings and assembling them is, uh, is going to prove a fantastic way forward. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, everybody, can you put your hands up for uh, Jason, please. Uh, it's been amazing uh, for his time, effort. We are almost at two hours of CPD already. I can't believe this. Uh, can we have Lyra and Jason video, please, uh, as I finish off with the question and answers? Um, so uh, we talked about that. Uh, I can see you now, okay, and you can see my screen. We know you know, uh, when do you know? I think we've talked about that. Is it too, I think we've covered that as well. I'm just gonna take the, um, the question back on the question and answers before I conclude. So just bear with me and then I'll just get the question. We've got five minutes for the question and answers before we conclude everybody. So I'm just gonna take, the, there's lots of questions coming in. There's about 10 already for you. Um, and I'm just gonna just quickly on, um, so there's a very important question. Uh, by an architect and an engineer, are mentors difficult to approach by few because they're expensive? <laughs> so I'll start with Jason on that one. Yeah, um, difficult to find. I'll answer that first one. Um, I think that is, that is um, on the mentee um, to spend quite a lot of time just finding the right person for them. Um, I think I did an article I wrote for Lyra um, that was published in America. Um, talking about the difficulties of this. And are they expensive? I think um, I'm not going to answer that question directly and how much mentors charge, but all I can say is um, if you're successful in your career after having a mentor, um, it, the payback is uh, tenfold. It really is. It's, um, yeah. you know, okay. people who, get, who, who are mentored are successful generally. Uh, Lyra from Chicago right now, what's your views? Yeah, so as far as the, um, the mentor, and are they difficult? Well, you know, when I look for a mentor, sometimes you know, I want the best. So I, I try to approach the best, best. And sometimes they could be intimidating. And especially if you're the ones that you're trying to reach out to are really the popular ones, or they have the, this brand recognition, the big names. And, you know, approaching them can be quite intimidating. However, I really feel that um, it's your job. It's our job. It's our responsibility, not as a mentor, but, you know, as a mentee, it's your job to choose your mentor. And if, even if, you know, no matter how much you like that mentor, but if that mentor is not receptive to you, then I think um, the best course of action is to look for another one. And there will be another one. Because sometimes mentors, you know, even if they don't have a big name, if they are effective in pushing you forward and reaching your goal, then I think you would, you know, be better off with that kind of mentor. Uh, I've got a great question from Madiha in China. Uh, what is the one thing which you wish you had done differently or earlier in your career path? So what is the one thing you wish you could have done right in the beginning of the career, starting with um, Jason on that one? Yeah, probably read uh, that book, 12 Pillars. Wow, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, Lyra? Well, I would probably... Um you know, choose more mentors. Because I, I felt like I limited myself 
to initially, you know, those ones that I reached out to, um, my first reaction, I'm like everybody else, you want your Frank Lloyd, if Frank Lloyd Wright was still alive, you want to be mentored by Frank Lloyd Wright, or Mies van der Rohe, or Sir Norman Foster, you know, all these big names. Um, but, you know, if I would have done it differently, I would have uh, probably chosen more mentors, not necessarily because of the big name. Wow. Uh, just a quick right. statement from Patrick. Uh, I have attended the Stephen Covey course some 15 years ago. So he attended the oh, Stephen wow. Covey course. And two things stand out for me. The way I am to live my life is start with the end in mind and seek to understand before being understood. So awesome quote there from Patrick. Mm. Um, another good question for you guys. What is your best hobby for cooling off? And how many hours do you sleep? So starting from um, Jason on that one. So best, yeah, I, you're cooling off and hours of sleep. So cool enough, I think for me personally, is just, it, it, it can be something as simple as just going for a walk outside. Um, and that's, that's what I do. So I don't punch a punching bag, uh, for, for example. Um, and sleep, sleep is, is critical. It's really important. Um, and I try and get eight hours, but I, I probably only succeed in about between six and seven. So I need to improve on sleeping. <laughs> wow, Lyra? Well, for me, first of all, is uh, seeking to understand first, right? So I think um, in every interaction that I have, I try to assume the best of their intentions for me. So regardless of what the reality would be, I just assume that that would be the case. And then the second, as far as um, how do I cool off, I live very close to the Chicago River, so that allows me to, um, even during lunch breaks, to go outside and take a walk. However, because of the social distancing, the river is closed. So these days I try to go out of my balcony to take some fresh air, or I, I actually draw. I have a hobby of um, drawing portraits, so or sketching um, anything that I see, like architecture buildings. So that's what I do. And then sleep. I really try to make it a point um, these days to sleep a full eight hours. And, you know, I'm, I'm very good at keeping that. <laughs> Fantastic. Two more, two more questions before we finish off with a question. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Uh, thank you, everybody. So when you look out for mentors, especially in your discipline, they seem reluctant, absent-minded to your desire for a mentor. Keep up with them or look out. So what advice would you say for people who can't really find the right mentor and, you know, would you, and they don't want to give up? So what's the advice? Don't, keep, don't give up to getting the right mentor. Yeah, do you want? Do so just yeah, first? please, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely is. Um, it is don't give up, but it's, um, it's also asking lots of your peers. So they could recommend um, someone who could mentor you. Um, you know, building a, a, a network is something I, I've been doing for many years. And on LinkedIn, it's, been, it's proven successful. So just ask as many people as possible, um, you know, and, and um, do your research and keep trying. That's all I can say. Lyra? So for me, for me um, the best thing, the best course of action, if, if, if they're reluctant, then it's a sign for you to actually maybe you're asking the wrong person. So I think as a mentee, it's really your job to choose the mentor. It's not the other way around. It's not the mentor choosing you. So if somebody is reluctant in helping you, um, go for the next one. So have a list, you know, go through your network, write it down and list them in order. So if one person in that list seems reluctant in helping you or difficult to approach, then go to the next one, go to the next one. And there will always be a next one. Okay, thank you. And finally, the last question before we conclude uh, from Michael, uh, what is the next for both of you? So you've great, both of you are, you reach greater height, you are massive role model for many in the world, as well as being fellow in your own rights. What is next for you guys? Starting with uh, Jason on that one. Yeah, um, I think I've got such a challenging project um, at work. Um, so, so delivering uh, this um, one of these uh, nuclear mega projects is probably 
the most challenging thing I've got for the next 10 years. Um, maybe that elusive uh, third fellowship as well. Um, wow. You know, um, but yeah, um, on a personal level, it's, um, it's actually uh, getting married. So, so yeah. Oh, excellent. And uh, Lyra? So for me, what's next is I want to bring that design of the full headpiece um, in mass production so that I could probably share it with the Chicago community um, for, um, for use during this pandemic. I'm also in the middle of redesigning a playground for a Montessori school in New York City um, when they start to planning for reopening, but it's a design for pandemics, so a playground that's intended to be, um, you know, with the pandemics in mind. There's no other playground has, that has done this wow. before. So we're, you know, reimagining a new playground. This is awesome. And we've got a, uh, uh, just a quick quote from someone. Uh, and he says, thanks a lot for this session. Very insightful, despite the fact I'm not an architect. Getting an architect frame of mind is key for me since I finance them from time to time. So uh, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, there's one more thing from another presenter from Mauritius this time. I believe that the princess was beautiful for helping others, just like the speaker here. Thank you to all of you, in particular for, his, uh, for your burning passion and for rebuilding the construction industry. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm now just going to share a few slides before I conclude and ask your final word of wisdom. So just stay where you are and we're just going to do a quick survey. Um, I'm just going to have you on video panel here and I'm just going to ask a quick survey because we, when we started, we want to conclude where we started. So there was a question where um, I was, uh, the, that was from Jason last question. Jason, when we started was saying, were we all good listeners? 70% of you said yes. And 30% of you said no. And then in between when Jason had the, you know, the listening um, session, you know, 50% of us fail and 50% were good. So I'm just going to launch polling now. And if you can see that, everybody can vote. So do you think you are a good listener still? So do you think you're still a good listener? I'm going to give you 20 seconds. There's 145 of you right now listening to us. Do you think you're still a good listener? Um, and 60% of you have voted. Please, please, please put your vote in. Uh, five seconds left. Do you think you're still a good listener? And I'm just going to say end polling now. So I'm going to share the result with everybody. And mm. wow, from 70%, yes. which was yes, has come down to 47%. And the nose has improved to 53%. Um, what's your quick, 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 quick one on that, Jason, before I'm... What's your views on that? Yeah, the, it, it fits the, uh, the stats, I think I said in the presentation that, you know, um, most of us think we're good listeners, but actually the, the fact is we're not. So it's a skill that everyone should seek to improve on. All right, thank you. Um, just quickly, uh, before I move on to the last question, is um, this one will be a, a really, uh, a last one. Um, so I just want to conclude. I just want to share everybody with a video before we conclude. So that's a tribute to um, women in construction. We've got Lyra, who's a massive support for women in the construction. So let's go for it. Let me just put my volume okay, and then off we go. Just bear with us. Here we go. Encom Construction is a civil engineering and building specialist. Um, we're a Welsh company based in Cardiff. We've been established for 15 years and we've got great experience across a range of construction sectors. The Career Changes project is focusing on ultimately getting more women in construction. We've got about 20% of women in the business at the moment. But that's something we're looking to increase, but it's much more than that. We're looking to provide mentoring training to support people when they start their journey into construction, but also when they're actually in construction. Women across Wales who currently work in construction have got a lot of experience that they can impart on new people in the industry. 
Encon Construction are working in partnership with a women's charity, Quarateg. We've also got Cardiff Community Housing Association, Glamorgan Construction Group, House Builders Federation, Acorn Recruitment on board as well to help partner with this project. So our mentoring project is absolutely fantastic. It's working specifically within the construction industry where there are a lack of female role models. Um, role models are so, so, so important because um, you can't be what you can't see. It's having that industry specific knowledge and it's having, um, it's having the experience of somebody who's been there and done that before. And I think having that voice, having that champion behind you to say, yes, you can and you should and you will and here's how, it, it can be life changing for people. I would say definitely do it. It's a fantastic opportunity to become a mentor and help more women to join the industry and stay with the industry. You have got a lot of skills that probably you don't even recognise yourself and it's going to help progress your career as well. As part of this project, we are offering mentoring training to 50 women across Wales, um, people who are already in the industry. Encon Construction are the first SME to have been funded by the CITB for a project of this size. We truly believe that women can make a real difference to the industry and therefore if you'd like to join our community and become a mentor, please click on the link below. Okay, so without any further ado, I've got this book for everybody. I'm, I'm going to ask the views of Lara shortly before I finish. So th please, 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 uh, this is a book I've read and um, it's a very important book actually and it's all about an impactful productive career is a result of many different influences in a person's life. Formal education, dedication and personal study are usually essential ingredient to career success but another often overlooked piece and perhaps the most important one is mentorship. So please, please, please get this book uh, forthcoming CPD will be staying ahead of the digital construction curve uh, by Vaughan Harris, something I'm working on, and the project manager who smile. Uh, this will be for next week. Everybody can join us as well. Uh, take care, be safe. And I just want to finally word of wisdom from, um, you know, Lyra, uh, Jason, and I'm just going to stop sharing. I've got one poll before I come to everybody. So having listened to Lyra and everybody, my last question to everyone now is, and the panelists can vote as well, would you like to get a mentor after Jason's presentation today, as well as Lyra being the role model from USA as well, and Jason from UK? Would you like to get a mentor after Jason's presentation today? Very, very important. Please, 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 we got 140 of you right now. Really wanna know, would you like to get a mentor after Jason presentation? Are you inspired to get a mentor as of today? 63% um, of you have voted. Please, please, please put your vote in. Uh, 64, please, can we just have one more vote? 64% um, of you have voted. So I'm just gonna end polling and share the result with everybody. So 100%. Wow. Wow, this is mind blowing stuff. 100% of you said yes, we want a mentor. Now, uh, I'm just going to stop reserve on that one and I'm going to stop sharing. Um, what's your views on the result first? Uh, Jason, 100% have voted. I mean, I'm, <sighs> I'm sure after two hours and 15 minutes, 15 minutes, this must be a relief that everybody wanted one mentor now. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fantastic, and um, you know, I'm glad I'm glad of that result, um, definitely. Okay, uh, Lyra, first that's, of all, that's you've uh, first of all, you've seen the video on women. I know you're a massive champion for women in architecture and women in construction. Uh, quickly before I jump to Jason for the final word of wisdom, but what's your thought on women as well as 100% of mentor? Yeah, so the, the, that's good news that 100% wanted to seek mentors right now. And then for women, for the women in construction. So don't limit yourself to mentors just within the industry. For example, for me as an architect, um, the people who mentored me are, you know, not necessarily in architecture. In fact, when I won the uh, AIA, the American Center of Architects, Athena Young Professional Leadership Award, I was sponsored and mentored by a structural engineer. 
So, so don't limit yourself to that. There are so many opportunities to be mentored and seek them out. You choose the mentor. Okay, and um, uh, Jason, final word of wisdom from you. Yeah, I can only echo that as well um, because my first mentor was in the music industry uh, and, you know, and, and that person was uh, really fantastic. Um, so, it, so again, I think just to expand on what Lyra said, it's seeking out that mentor, put your effort into, into, into that first and trying to find that great person that's, um, you, um, that, that will work for you and is successful already and, and surround yourself with as many um, like-minded individuals as possible, which, which will, will always help you. Jason, finally, before I move to Lyra, what's the best piece of advice you were given in your life? Ah, oh, I think it's, um, I think um, that, that's, a, that's a really tough question. You've got me on that one. But it, it, would, be, it would be to um, actually get a mentor. Wow. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jason. And Lyra, to finish on you, um, final word of wisdom to all the architects listening to you from Mauritius right now and colleagues around the world. You know, what's your final word of wisdom to all of us here in Mauritius? So we live on uncertain times. And most definitely when we come out, everyone, regardless of where you are in the world, when we come out of this pandemic, there is still uncertainty. So I would you know, suggest embrace that uncertainty, be comfortable with any type of uncertainty and know that it is a marathon. So after we overcome this challenge of the pandemic, it will be a marathon regardless of industry. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon, but stay with the course. Okay, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm just now gonna just finish off and uh, um, you can see my screen, everybody? Okay, so I would like to uh, thank everybody for the time, effort, and uh, guys, put your hands up for Jason, who has spent almost three hours with me right now because we started earlier for some, uh, you know, catching up and everything else. Uh, please put your hands up for uh, Lyra from Chicago as well. Uh, it's been brilliant. So Lyra, I've got your title there as well, just to make sure we've got you right. Um, you know, I think we can't thank you enough for giving your time, your dedication, your passion. And all within like, you know, five, six days, we got together and I connected with Lyra yesterday, just to let you know, for her time. And, and she said, yes, I want to be here with all of us today. And already we've got 140 plus uh, listening to us. So please, please give your feedback on email. Uh, there'll be a certificate attendance. We'd love to have your feedback on WhatsApp, on email which I will then forward to the speakers for the time and effort for giving back. So thank you. Uh, maybe a big wave, uh, everybody. Uh, Jason, before we conclude our meeting, uh, if you can just please uh, thank you very much and uh, all of you. So thank you, everybody. It's been great. And I will see you for the next one as I stop sharing. So thank you. And uh, maybe again, a big wave. Now we can see you on the screen as well as we'll be having recorded. Jason, thank you very much indeed. And we shall see you um, hopefully in a year's time when we can catch up post COVID and then share your experience. And maybe you can have more fellowship, um, you know, and you can share more of experience, but we're not going to stop here. I'm sure you're going to give back more uh, and share your wisdom to us here in Mauritius uh, and, and many countries around the world as well. And in Africa as well. So thank you everybody. Take care and I'll see you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.